Good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a great IMARC. My name is Jorgen Sandström. Uh, I'm from the World Economic Forum. Uh, I am a program manager inside the Center for Energy and Materials, and I lead uh, a program on industrial transformation. I used to be the head of mining and metals at the World Economic Forum. And today we work, uh, spending a lot of time nowadays on the uh, energy transition from the industrial uh, perspective. We work on uh, topics such as acceleration of green hydrogen, uh, transitioning industrial clusters. We have a quite significant uh, focus on demand and reducing the energy intensity in the energy transition and also um, uh, increasing demand for uh, green products, green steel, green aluminium, uh, green cement and concrete, green transport over an initiative that we call the First Movers Coalition. Uh, with me today, I have uh, a very eminent uh, group of speakers. Uh, we have Gillian Cagney, who is president Australia and New Zealand of Worley. Uh, we have Andrew Hinchcliffe, who's gr Group Executive, Institutional Bank uh, of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. We have Sam Crofter, who's Chief Executive uh, Officer at the Office of Hydrogen Power of South Australia. And we have Mark Kutifani, who's Chair of Vale Base Metals. You are very welcome to the panel. Uh, we have about 40 minutes to discuss uh, the um, topic of unlocking Australia's energy transition from a global to a country perspective. And the forum is since about 15 years tracking the energy transition. And we do this uh, uh, through a specific intelligence program where we look at just about every country uh, on the planet and how they are transitioning. And when it comes to Australia, and this is a bit of a longer perspective, uh, we think that Australia is very well positioned to lead in the energy transition. It has abundant clean energy resources and an abundant amount of critical uh, minerals, uh, competitive research and a developed ecosystem uh, and an, an ambitious policy agenda. Um, we also see that uh, the energy transition do need uh, uh, or requires targeted policies. It requires large volumes of investment in low carbon technologies. It requires enabling infrastructure to deliver secure, sustainable and affordable energy. And it also opens up uh, uh, for a lot of new opportunities uh, to create new growth industries. Uh, in 2022, Australia enshrined its environmental sustainability ambitions into law, uh, enacting the Climate Change Act. And the energy and heavy industrial sectors, which are the primary sources of greenhouse gas emissions in Australia, uh, will require significant, significant trans transformation for Australia to achieve its targets of 43% emissions reductions by 2030 and net zero by 2050. So Australia is well positioned to lead uh, in, uh, in the global energy transition. Uh, but how do we do this? How, what is required now today to unlock Australia's energy transition? I thought I'd start by asking Sam uh, uh, and to give us uh, the government perspective. Uh, the Australian government has the vision to become a renewable energy superpower. But what does this mean practically? Thanks, uh, Jorgen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I think the uh, energy superpower concept is really about um, taking that advantage we have in clean energy um, and the abundance of it and um, being able to unlock it in a way that can provide um, really um, affordable uh, and world-leading low-cost low renewable energy, which we can then look to utilise as we transition our industries. And I think that... Um, as the world uh, is looking to transition, I've been having a, 
conversation around if you take the steel industry, um, be it in, in Korea or Japan or even in Europe, as the steel industry looks to transition, they're realising that um, it's going to be very hard for them to get the amount of um, renewable inputs that they need uh, where they are. So in terms of getting hydrogen transported to Europe, for example, at the quantities you need to transition that industry is going to be very difficult. The opportunity for Australia then comes in, how do we, if we're going to be looking at things using our renewable energy to produce hydrogen, um, clean hydrogen, and if we're going to get to sort of that world scale that's talked about to capitalise on that renewable energy resource that we have, what do we best do with that as a country? Uh, and I think there's opportunities around export, but I think really the opportunity is how do, we, how do we transition our industry and how do we start to value add by producing products that the rest of the world needs as they transition. So I think that's the opportunity that opens up. Uh, I think it's an opportunity that we can see playing out through green iron, you know, green steel, absolutely, but green iron um, input products that can be used by other steel manufacturers helps us value add, increase the complexity of our economy, but using that renewable resource that we have, which I think is the advantage that we have at the moment in Australia. Thank you very much. And if I then turn to Mark and to give us a bit of the mining, minerals, industrial perspective. Uh, I mean, I think we all can say that it's very acknowledged that minerals are critical to enable the energy transition. But in the Australian context, what is the role of the mining and metals industry to help realize this transition? Well, thank you for the opportunity and uh, to be with the colleagues. Great privilege to be here. Um, I certainly don't want my comments to be read as negative. Uh, I will generally focus on the things that I think we could do better. That's not to say it's a negative commentary on the industry. So let me put that uh, out there first up. Um, in terms of the Australian mineral sector, I think our role in supporting the energy transition starts with making sure we help people understand what the role of minerals are in society. And the ignorance that we see across the globe of people not understanding that without minerals the world just simply doesn't work, that, that we help shrink human footprints on the planet by some 20 to 30% and we take up 0.3% of the Earth's surface. So people don't appreciate that from a net environmental impact perspective, we are the most significant and most positive industry on the face of the planet. Most of us don't know that fact either. And I'll give you one example. Agricultural sector takes up 40% of the Earth's surface. Without mining and without fertilizers specifically, we'd need 50 to 60% of the Earth's surface to grow the food that we need to support 8 billion people. And I can talk about urbanised footprints, the ability to build up is facilitated by the use of our products. And quite frankly, without the mining sector, there would be no biodiversity. And that's a fact that we need to help people understand across the globe in setting the context for our conversation. So that's number one. Two, in terms of critical enablers, when we work with governments, we need federal and state policies to actually talk to each other and to be consistent to help us make sure that we develop the industry on a consistent basis. And it's one thing for us to criticise, if you like, the politicians, and that's easy to do, but in our own case as an industry, we're not very good at collaborating and working together to help governments develop their policy frameworks in relation to our industry. And so before we point the finger at politicians, we need to make sure that we're working better to help politicians understand the frameworks we require, whether it's for land access, whether it's for, for development, whether if it's for any of the activities that we undertake, it's absolutely critical. In terms of the energy transition conversation, people talk about critical minerals. But the most important metal for the energy transition is steel. Copper, obviously critical. But in terms of steel in Australia's uh, iron ore resources and, and met coal resources are actually critical for the world in terms of the energy transition. And if you look at the royalty regimes that we've put on in some states and some of these minerals, crazy. We should be looking at tax incentives to encourage companies to invest in new technologies to reduce energy footprints. 
and not look at, if you like, developing and, and building our uh, consolidated revenue basis. And again, that policy perspective needs to sit across all of the jurisdictions. So it's not meant to be a criticism of one jurisdiction, it's a criticism of the whole and how we need to work together. And I think that's where we can, as an industry, do a much better job in those conversations. Finally, in terms of the industry itself, if you look at our current technologies and processes, we're probably 30 to 40% inefficient in terms of what we could be doing in terms of current technologies. We need to do a lot better in terms of the way we operate, the way we produce, and the way we make contributions. And also, as an industry, how we connect with our local communities, whether they be First Nations, whether they be local communities in terms of those that are developed and we're looking to develop next to. And we need to make sure that we're looking after those communities because at the end of the day, we only take up 0.3% of the Earth's surface and those that we impact most are local communities, yet they tend to get the raw deal. And if we want this to work properly, it has to be fair and reasonable for all the players, and I don't think we've got those relationships right. So I could keep going, but I think I should shut up and let the next person speak. Thank you, Mark. We'll come back to, to minerals and, and the strategic importance of, of the, the minerals and the metals. If we, we then go to the next topic that is crucial for the energy transition is the transition finance uh, part and it's, it's ob an obvious key to unlocking additional resources, uh, ad additional, ad additional capital towards zero carbon solutions. And there's a lot of work also at the forum on how do we improve the risk uh, and, and the return profiles of, of, of these new types of projects. Uh, because they're often risky uh, or too capital intensive uh, for traditional finances to invest in. Um, how do we work with uh, the classical key de-riskers, governments, multilateral development banks, uh, insurers? How can we work together with banks and investors to uh, identify innovative ways to blend capital and improve commercial profitability uh, of net zero technology in Australia. So my question to you, uh, Andrew, is does this happen today in Australia and how can we work uh, on this topic in Australia? Yeah, thanks, Jürgen. Uh, and look, great to be here. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, maybe let me, let me start with kind of what it takes for capital to flow into certain projects. And the first thing is, I think, which I think probably Mark touched on uh, and Sam, is stability of policy. You know, we need certainty of policy, stability of policy at a government level. And I think that's more than just sort of the, the national government, the state government, but also globally. And we're getting better at that, obviously, uh, with our, our net zero ambitions by 2050, as well as sort of the targets by 2030. Uh, things like the safeguard mechanism as well. Uh, you know, pools of government capital being made available. All these things are starting to work in harmony, which, you know, then has the ability to attract private capital into certain areas with that certainty. So that's probably point one. I think the second point, which is the, the last, uh, towards the end of your question, which is around how, uh, how do we change the economic incentives, uh, make certain technologies commercially viable, is we need to change uh, the way we measure uh, the, the economic value of businesses. And what I mean by that is we need to value the negative externalities associated with them, which is ultimately comes down to our carbon emissions, given that's the thing that we're trying to measure and ultimately mitigate. You know, that could also be nature, our know, effect on nature as well through biodiversity. But if we put a price on those externalities and value them in our, in our corporate finance, then that changes the economic value of industries that then has private capital a way of evaluating is it a good investment or a bad investment for us. And then I think the final thing is, you know, which is what you touched on, how do we actually partner with different pools of capital? And, and that, those pools of capital can be government capital, you know, which is everything from the CFC to powering the regions fund to the National Reconstruction Fund, Hydrogen Head Start program to other private pools of capital where we've all got a different risk appetite, uh, you know, insurance money, pension money, uh, you know, private equity, uh, banks, uh, capital markets. 
ultimately we need to make sure those pools of capital find their way into the right areas of uh, required investment that satisfies the cheapest uh, cost of capital, um, but equally provides the necessary capital um, where, and, and I think a, a good example of that can be, um, there are certain technologies that just aren't viable at the moment. No private capital will flow into them without the necessary, uh, the sort of government subsidies or incentives finding its way in there to unlock kind of the market. And hydrogen may be an example of that. Um, another part of it could be, actually we just need more scale of capital. So how does government you know, work closely with private to deliver more scale of what's actually needed. And then the other part can be just actually reducing the cost uh, of overall capital. A good example is Karanji Battery, uh, which we recently closed down in Victoria. We financed, you know, it was quite innovative uh, financing in that, you know, in, the, in order to drive grid stability, uh, which is ultimately what we need as coal-fired power sort of runs down, uh, we need, uh, uh, you know, to provide uh, grid um, stability services. And AMO uh, has provided a 20-year offtake uh, for that battery, um, you know, in order to uh, provide those battery um, stability services. But the presence of that government money flowing in there on a 20 year offtake provides an incentive for private capital to come in and build the battery in the first place. So there are many different things that sort of need to work in harmony, harmony to drive capital into the right areas. But what I would say is I don't think it's going to be a shortage of capital. You know, I think there's plenty of it there. It's just finding its way into the right areas uh, with the right economic incentives. Um, but it is there to go. Thank you, Andrew. Um, a lot of this comes together in infrastructure and, and, and not least now the needed shared infrastructure uh, going forward. According to many experts, uh, the infrastructure delivery process needs to change replacing the tra traditional project delivery approach with a more systems focused approach. Ones that take into account social and environmental value, uh, ESG value and other, other values. Um, what are the main challenges in delivering infrastructure in Australia based on those principles? And if I turn to you then, Gillian, what, what, do you, what lessons do you have to share with us? Thanks, Jorgen, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to be here today to, to talk about this. And um, so our organization, we, we deliver projects. Um, and I think one of the key things we're going to see to enable this energy transition um, is, a, is about how we deliver projects. So it's really about reimagining what we need to do. Um, and from a, a, a worldly perspective, we've actually been partnering with the um, Princeton University's uh, um, Andlinger Center for Energy and Environment. And really, look, we see there are five key shifts as an industry um, that we need to make in how we deliver these projects. And the first one is around broadening the values. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, it's not just about the financial return, but it's also the, the economic and the, um, the social value that these projects can bring to, um, to regions and communities. Um, it's about keeping all our technology options open. There is no one solution. So it's actually allowing the various different technologies um, to build and to grow. Um, it's about designing one and building many. Um, I think many uh, engineers or customers in the room will have heard that multiple times. But if we are truly going to deliver this energy transition at scale, it's actually um, starting to standardize those key areas which will allow us to unlock um, the value in, in, the, uh, in the project life cycle um, and bringing in technology. But probably one of the most key ones is around um, collaboration and uh, communication. I think everyone on the panel here today has talked about that. Um, but projects will only ever move at the pace that the, of the trust within the, psych or within, um, within the various organizations. Um, and if we think about the challenges that we have from a, a state to our federal to state and then working within the, um, the, the procurement cycle and, and, and managing the various different activities through that and the, the requirement to de-risk, I think that true sense of collaboration and really coming to the table with a level of transparency about how we're actually going to deliver this is going to be one of the key enablers to unlocking the, the scale of the transformation we have to deliver. Thank you. Uh, we will take questions from the floor in a moment, but I thought 
we just continue the, the discussion a bit. Um, if, I, if, if we now look at these different angles of, of government, of policy, regulation, uh, uh, from a more of an industrial mining and metals, industrial uh, perspective, finance, what needs to be done in the transition finance uh, uh, space, and then technology and infrastructure. Um, if I start with you, uh, Sam, uh, what do you see as the one biggest challenge? What is the one biggest challenge facing Australia's energy transition? And how can different stakeholders collaborate to accelerate the transition? Uh, I think, I think probably um, the scale of development of renewables that we're talking about is a significant change of land use. So, I think where the concept that we've always been used to a little bit is driving past some wind turbines on a hill in the distance. What we're talking about, if we're going to develop gigawatt scale renewables, is a significant change of land use. So, I do think there's a, a conversation with communities up front, which is going to be pivotal and and enabling that um, collaboration and partnership that you need with trad traditional owner groups, with other communities, broader communities, um, around how we can get that done and, and manage that transition and that change of land use. Uh, and I think if I can take a cheeky second one, the other thing is going to be the transmission infrastructure required to make this happen. So that uh, obviously is where things like rewiring the nation come into play with the federal government's fund and, and bringing together some collaboration around financing, which is the pathway they're taking on that. But but to, um, to effectively unlock the benefits of that, we have to be able to do that in an affordable way so that we can have um, that cheaper energy. Uh, and so we're getting transmission right, building the, the projects in the right areas uh, and being able to get that energy to the right industrial uses is gonna be pivotal. Thank you. And Mark, what is the one, one biggest challenge facing Australia? Um, <clears throat> I'll run off Sam's point. Um, I uh, went to Wollongong on Sunday, um, so getting home, not as much as I used to. Um, and I thought it was quite amazing. I, I looked at the city centre and there wasn't much going on. Uh, but down South Beach, there was a protest group, 3,000 people, protesting uh, the potential uh, or the proposal to build wind turbines off the coast for energy. So for me, the real question is how do we bring the country together in helping people understand the challenge and how each of us has to play a part in being part of the solution because everyone has to play a, a part. And, and the not in my backyard, I mean, our backyards are all going to look very different as a consequence of this energy transition, and it is a transition, and it's going to require us to step through the use of oil, gas, and move into new technologies which will impact everybody, and everybody's got a role to play. And so I think from the federal government right the way through to companies, we all have to do a job in helping people understand what the change looks like and how each of us has to play a role both in our professional and private lives in supporting the change. I think that's Australia's biggest challenge at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, you want to come in on this one? Yeah, I mean, a bill on that. Social licence, I think, is uh, extremely important. Uh, it's everybody's job to transition. Um, yeah, and we, what we don't want is the burden to fall disproportionately on certain cohorts of people or countries for that matter. Um, so really important. I think the other big issue is just capabilities. Uh, capital will come, but you've got things like the IRA happening in America where you know, it'll naturally drain talent towards sort of that pool of money. Um, we need to make sure that we build the capabilities. From my understanding, and there'll be people in the room that know better than I do, it probably takes about seven years to train up an apprentice as a grid engineer. We need a lot of them to build 10,000 kilometres of grid. Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, a huge constraint just to be able to get done what we need to do without even thinking about how to develop new export industries. Thank you. Um, Gillian? Um, I, I think it ultimately, as I mentioned earlier, comes back to trust and it's all the way down from government uh, down through um, to our, our own individual trust and, and that ability to, to have that uh, conversation with the next door neighbor or, or with your young nine year old and, and, and actually creating that level of knowledge and understanding about what is the greater 
good an outcome that we're trying to deliver and, and how we're going to deliver that. But ultimately, projects move at the pace of trust. And if we think about the trust within our system today, um, we've got a few hurdles to overcome to, um, to really get ourselves into a position where we're actually at net zero 2050. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? Yeah, hi, Paul Mitchell from EY. Um, thanks for the comments on iron ore and um, met coal, Mark. Certainly agree with that one. They are critical and we need to take a natural advantage. My question is just on, um, on vertical integration and just, you know, how do we facilitate vertical integration and value add so that we move from just minerals to, to materials and metals and, and, and take more of a share value share as we move forward? Who would like to answer? Yeah. Um, as a group, we talked about this point um, before we walked out. And um, uh, first point, Paul, I think we need to get ourselves into the right conversations. For me, scope three conversations are misleading we need to talk about scope four conversations where we look at the full value chain in each of our industries to try and understand where gases are generate, carbon gases are generated or where carbon deports and how we look at building total systems that are far less in terms of carbon uh, intensity. What that means is there is certainly a strong argument to build more downstream processing capacity in Australia to take advantage of our natural uh, mineral endowment. But at the same time, when you think about circular economy, recycling steel in centres closer to the big consumers also makes sense. So the question is, how much capacity should we and could we build, for example, focusing on green steel, but at the same time, how much should be built in those bigger consuming areas to make sure that we get the balance right on a global basis? So what's our competitive advantage? What we, can we do to take advantage uh, of the position we have? But at the same time, how do we fit into the global system and what's the best answer for the globe is something that's going to require collaboration across multiple jurisdictions. But it's key in terms of supporting 8 billion people on the planet. They are the conversations we now have to have. Thank you. But, the, but the, as we discussed earlier also, the potential is enormous in Australia, no? with 50% of world's reserve on iron ore, but only less than 2% of global steam making or something like that. I should make the point that we debated this point and I said that um, the iron ore mineral resource that we have might argue for a much bigger proportion of the industry, but I said if you take a full cycle view, it might not be as big as we think. So we've got to think very carefully about those debates in terms of how we play our role and what our true advantage is. Absolutely. And just to build on that, where we are going to be able to create that economic value and create that good business case, it will mean we'll need to see organizations collaborate on joint infrastructure to really create that value so that we're actually creating value to the end product and not creating uh, multiple streams of um, the, the same product or commodity, but uh, also multiple sets of infrastructure. So I think that's key to, to unlocking that and actually creating true value for Australia. We, we have yeah. another question. Yeah. Any more questions from the panels? Otherwise, we take another question. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. Mark Robinson, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, EITI. Thank you, panel, for um, highlighting the great opportunities facing Australia to become or to realize its ambition of becoming a global mining superpower. What do you think some of the risks and challenges are inhibiting progress towards Australia achieving and realizing that ambition? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, happy to go start. for it. Well, I mean, I, I think the risks, the risk and uh, the risks and challenge are a little bit of what we've actually discussed. Do you mean as in we don't get sort of stability around policy? Uh, probably importantly, um, 
you know, the risks that other countries move a lot quicker with more capital and more expertise. Um, the risk that we don't necessarily get uh, a harmonised view of the world in terms of, you know, the social licence and getting everybody on the same page with the right goals. Uh, and also the risk that we don't provide the right value or incentives on the right industries. Um, therefore, we, we have waste um, that doesn't drive us forward at the right sort of speed. And, and to the extent that all of that sort of plays out, uh, you know, to use an extreme term, you know, the risks are that the country becomes far more of a stranded asset than this uh, extraordinary export powerhouse that we've been in the past. The flip side of that is if we do move quickly on all of those risks, you know, then it can be quite binary the other way. You know, we, we're a critical part of serving the rest of the world through the clean, you know, energy sort of future and transition with, you know, probably the top five deposits of critical minerals required, you know, a, a, a across the world, um, you know, strong ESG principles, uh, you know, extraordinary sort of natural resources in terms of wind and coastline and, um, and solar. You know, and so if we if we move really quickly, the opportunity is extraordinary. You know, I think puts even a, a greater competitive advantage potentially as a country than we've even had over the last 20 to 30 years. So to me, if we get organised, it's quite binary. We either become far more risky as a country if we don't, uh, or we you know fall into extraordinary opportunity if we do. That's going to take a lot of uh, you know policy uh, alignment, collaboration, uh, and and capital to find its way into the right areas. Thank you. Some more questions from the floor. Hi, my name is Tricia Wonch. I'm a partner with uh, Global Sustainability Consultancy, ERM. Um, going back to social license, um, I suppose my question is there, I think when it comes to, to getting social license, consulting the community, um, we're certainly finding, particularly with offshore wind, uh, those that are applying for feasibility licenses um, are you know, willing to, if they're successful, do the engagement that's required with communities, but they're conscious that there's already in some cases over engagement, um, that they're just, you know, there seems to be um, a real lack of knowledge of what's coming. Sam, you were talking about it, and I don't want to necessarily single you out, but I am wondering what the panel thinks about the role of government. How do we achieve a cohesive approach to that um, social license to operate when you've got, you know, so many um, in the private sector, so many different players that are that are in this, willing to do their bit, and yet um, it's hard to get to get cohesion if that's the approach. So, I think there is a role for government uh, in getting the legislative settings right. So, just in South Australia, we've currently got before the parliament a new hydrogen renewable energy act and. The first thing that we did before putting out a discussion paper and going through the process was we had forum, a forum with all 24 traditional owner groups in South Australia. Uh, and it's actually very rare that those, that group comes together as a group. But what we were able to do was talk about this new legislation, talk about the industry, talk about the scale of change, the land use and what was coming, uh, and really have a discussion about that. And um, the outcome of that was that the Aboriginal groups were very, very keen to share their land with the rest of the community to take this opportunity up, um, but we need to put in place the right structures and frameworks to enable protection of heritage and, and native title and other things. So um, I guess I think it, um, that's one example. Uh, it doesn't work for everywhere, but I think that upfront and being early and government's role is around providing those structures and frameworks um, because that also provides certainty to industry. So. What we're offering there is an approvals pathway all the way from renewable development to hydrogen production, derivative product production, and then use either domestically or export, um, all through one regulatory pathway with a single window to government. So industry is very happy to have that, um, uh, and that helps, but it only helps if you've done the work properly to make sure that the areas that we're looking to release for renewable energy generation are in line with traditional owner expectations, have an environmental overview, et cetera. So I do think there's a role for government but it, it certainly has to be, a government also can't do it all. So it is that collaboration again, which is really important. Yeah. Others want to come in and, and comment on recommendations for government to, to um, help uh, with, perhaps with private sector confidence in new, new projects for the transition? Mark? Oh, well, I'm just going to say that there are 
a number of groups today that are working with a concept called collaborative regional development. And there are some good examples in Africa, for example, uh, that desperately needs this type of approach where mining companies, other businesses associated in particular with infrastructure development are sitting with regional governments, provincial governments, state governments and local communities looking at the needs of those communities one year, five year, ten year, twenty year and the businesses are proposing how to bring water, energy, roads, all forms of infrastructure that they require to be successful and are designing the infrastructure requirements around community needs, both specific and current, and also reflecting what the community is looking to achieve in of itself in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So it starts with trust. So Gillian's uh, point about you know, building trust is the key. And those conversations and facilitating those conversations around infrastructure where you've got all the players involved, in my view, has become a real game changer in Africa. And I'd say that in Australia, we've got a number of the structures and we're probably better organised at a government level, but in some ways it's allowing us to not think about engaging communities in a very different way and businesses all around the same table, finding the solutions together. So it's co-designed. Back to the question, it's about co-design. It's not about collaboration or engagement because that, for many communities, is insulting. They want to be involved in the design of the solutions. So that collaboration and co-design, I think, is a more important concept that we need to push to help build that trust. And I think that's the key. Thank you, Mark. Gila, you want to come in? Andrew, any other questions from, from the floor? Yes. Aldo Souza from Accenture. Uh, still on the social legitimacy, uh, you mentioned uh, a great example, Mark, on the CRD, but how we as an industry and private sector take it uh, at scale, right? Because we see these problems repeating across different jurisdictions and on a global scale, but we haven't seen uh, the solution as well in that same scale, right? But the industry is able to that. It demonstrated the reaction on the GISTM, for instance, right? The, the reaction of the industry was great. So what can private sector as a whole, shareholders plus mining companies, do differently in that, uh, in that regard? And maybe you, Andrew, could help on that one as well. I don't know if I've got a better answer than Mark, actually. Um, you know, uh, you know I, li I like the, the topic of trust that Gillian brought out. Um, you know, you know, collaboration, obviously important. Co-design, I think, is a great word. Um, you know, time is obviously the essence as well. You know, and, you know, you, you need to consult, you need to co-design, but equally, you know, we don't want to sort of over-consult or over-design as well. Otherwise, you know, we'll never get anywhere and we know we need to move pretty quickly to sort of solve this collective problem. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, you know, I believe the right economic incentives uh, help as well, you know, whether it be sort of co-ownership of projects, be it sort of indigenous communities around carbon farming or our farmers, so changing the economic value of land, I think is, is really important. And, and I think ultimately, if you get the right economic incentives through carbon markets or biodiversity credits or uh, renewable energy certificates, whatever it may be, you know, that change, that change in economic uh, um, incentives all of a sudden drive sort of herd behaviour sort of in the right direction. That's what I was going back to sort of a little bit earlier. But equally, I'm, I'm acutely aware that sometimes it's not just economic incentives that are standing in the way. You, know, you could speak to many farmers. It's not about the economics. It's about it's a, a long-owned family farm, for example, and they simply just don't want a grid going across the top of that. And money's not going to solve that. And that's a really, really complicated topic, which I think comes back to just takes a lot of early consultation and bringing them to be part of the, the, the solution. Any other comments? I think just Sorry, quickly uh, on that, uh, like I think coming back to Andrew's point is 
I don't think uh, social consulting is something that you, we do at scale. I actually think it, it comes back to that farmer, it com comes back to that individual, and that's why early engagement, and I think that's where councils and um, regional government have a really important part to play in actually supporting the industry on that journey, because it is about what's, what's the impact on that particular individual or that particular group, um, and then creating a solution that is a win-win for both. And, and, and I think that's where the challenge of scale comes. I think it's all about early collaboration, or I love your word, co-design. <laughs> we have uh, one more question, if that's okay, Jorgen. Yeah, we have one more minute left, so we need to go. Okay, I was gonna ask about the social thing as well. Rick Valenta from the Sustainable Minerals Institute, but I'm gonna change because there've been lots of questions on that topic. The other one that I think is, is really interesting, and there's been some recent debates about it, I'd love to hear what the panel's thoughts are about whether they think Australia is really going to develop any sort of a downstream industry associated with the energy transition because um, there was a forum in Canberra a few months ago where, or a couple of months ago where, where there were very different opinions on that. The, the chair of Tesla put forward a, a really strong case to develop that downstream, um, that downstream capability. And, and the chair of the Productivity Commission said, no, we're fine, we should just stay digging ship, that's what we're good at. And I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on that. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so I think, um, I think the conversation around hydrogen, for example, is changing. I think it was a bit about, let's just export and, and how can we get this to the rest of the world? But I think really now as the, we're becoming more sophisticated about how do we use that for um, you know, value adding into products like we discussed earlier, uh, and I think the, the, in South Australia, the, we're, we're, the South Australian government has put $600 million into a hydrogen facility to build it at scale because we haven't seen it get to scale yet, 250 megawatts. If we want to get to gigawatt scale to unlock these opportunities, someone needs to do that. So I think that's an example of collaboration. We're working with the private sector to deliver that project to try and demonstrate that. So, and I think this, we're very, very interested in that hydrogen being used for domestic use and getting some industry out of that, I think, is an example. And, and we're not the only ones. It's, I think it's happening around the country now. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Any comments? No, no, I'm good. Anything on downstream? No? Yes, Mark? I think, I think we have to be realistic and build off our advantages, but I think there's no doubt in the world that long-term Australia needs to do a lot more downstream and, and create value in a very different way. And I think that thinking has to start now. So let's make sure we get the best out of what we've got but think long term around the infrastructure that we're putting in place to help build on those advantages and make it a long term strategy, not a short term dig uh, and uh, dig and deliver. It needs to be a lot more than that. And I think that thinking has to start now. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you for the questions and thank you for for attending this session. I think we can just try to, I can just try to summarize it in two words. Uh, one is we need a genuine 360 view on all these topics. I think there's a lot, a lot of opportunities and, and I think Australia continue to be extremely well positioned and, and I do think there's a lot of opportunities that, that can be further developed uh, in Australia. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on the people positive side of this. Uh, I think it's absolutely needed, uh, and we we heard it today. The value of value of uh, not just financial value or industrial value, or or or, but also the ESG value and 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 the cultural value. Collaboration, finally, uh, key to success is willingness to collaborate, strike out in new types of partnership, unlikely marriages. Somebody said yesterday, uh, and I think. Uh, I think this conversation will continue. Uh, so thank you again and see you soon somewhere else. <laughs>